بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد today إن شاء الله تعالى I wanted to start uh, our series of classes regarding the tafsir of Surah to Yusuf so إن شاء الله تعالى be patient with us while we take this journey إن شاء الله تعالى very beautiful surah a lot of benefit a lot of fawaid uh, a lot of ibar a lot of lessons in the surah and inshallah ta'ala we'll start with some of the beginning verses in the surah the first thing i want to mention about the surah is that surah is makkia and this means that the surah was revealed not in mecca but before the hijrah when the scholars say that the surah is makkia or madinia it does not mean that the surah was revealed in Mecca or Medina it means if it's Mecca it means it was revealed before the Hijrah and if it is Medina then it is it was revealed after the Hijrah and not necessarily in the cities of Mecca or Medina as we know revelation came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam outside of Mecca and outside of Medina and we'll go back to this point because it's important for us to understand the differences between the surahs that were revealed in Mecca or in the Meccan period before the Hijrah and those that were revealed after uh, the Hijrah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in, in this surah, نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَصِ بِمَا أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ وَإِن كُنْتَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ لَمِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that indeed we reveal to you the best of stories or the most amazing stories as the word Ahsan the scholars of Tafsir say that this means A'jab Ahsan Yani A'jab we reveal to you the most amazing stories alright and unfortunately there has been a tradition passed down from generation to generation that Surah to Yusuf is the most beautiful story in the Quran we will debunk that myth and show that Surah to Yusuf is not the most beautiful story in the Quran. Rather, all of the stories that are in the Quran are beautiful. And there are surahs, there are stories in the Quran that are more beautiful than the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. And we'll explain why. But this is something that has been passed down, you know, traditionally from one generation of Muslims to the next, that this is translated as the most beautiful story. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used qasas which is the plural of qissa, the plural. So it doesn't mean that Allah revealed the most beautiful story. He says he reveals the most beautiful stories. بِمَا أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ What has been revealed to you from this Qur'an? وَإِن كُنْتَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ لَمِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ Which before the revelation of these stories, you did not know about them. اختلف العلماء لما سميت هذه الصورة أحسن القصص من بين سائر القصص. The scholars they differ as it relates to why this particular sura is called أحسن القصص, the most beautiful of stories, um, as opposed to the other stories that were mentioned in the Quran. And there are four different أقوال, four different. Um, opinions on why this surah is called the best of stories. Number one, أنه ليس في القرآن قصة تتضمن من العبر والحكم ما تتضمن هذه القصة كما قال الله تعالى في آخرها ولقد كان في قصصهم عبرة لأولي الألباب. The first reason why the scholars say that this is the best of stories or the the most amazing of stories is that this particular surah, it contains or comprises of many lessons, many benefits, many, you know, jewels of wisdom that is not found in any other story in the Qur'an. As Allah mentions in the latter part of the surah, that indeed in their stories, there are lessons for men of understanding. Number two, لِحُسْنِ مُحَاوَرَ or مُجَاوَزَ مُجَاوَزَ Yusuf. عن إخوته وصبره على أذاه على أذاهم. It's called the most amazing of stories is because the beautiful way that Yusuf dealt with his brothers and the patience that he exerted in the harm that they caused him. 
Number three, لِأَنَّ فِيهَا ذِكْرُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ وَالْمَلَائِكَةِ That in this surah is the mention of the prophets, is the mention of, you know, the righteous, and there are mentions of the angels, and other things that will make this the, amazing, the most amazing stories. Number four, قِيلَ لِأَنَّ كُلَّ مَا ذُكِرَ فِيهَا كَانَ مَآلَهُ سَعَادًا that everyone that was mentioned in this surah, they all had a good and successful ending. Every individual that was mentioned in this surah, they had a ma'al hasana. They had a good a ma'al sa'ada. They had a good ending. He said, Unthur ila Yusuf. Look at Yusuf and how he ended up. Wa abihi. And look at his father, Prophet Ya'qub and how he ended up. Look at Ikhwatihi, look at his, his brothers and how they ended up. Look at the Imra'atul Aziz, look at the wife of the Aziz and how she ended up. Look at, at the Malik, the one who had the dream and look at how he ended up. Uh, look at the, the Shahid, the one who witnessed the incident between Yusuf and the Aziz and how the witness ended up. The Musta'bir al Ru'ya, those who interpreted you know, or try to interpret the dream of the king and how they ended up. Everyone, he said, فَكَانَ أَمْرُ الْجَمِيعِ إِلَّا خير. فَمَا كَانَ أَمْرُ الْجَمِيعِ إِلَّا خير. So the end result of everyone that was mentioned in this surah was a successful and happy ending for everyone. أَنَّ اللَّهَ سُبْحَانَ وَتَعَالَى لَمْ يُثَنَّ قِصَّةَ قِصَّةَ يُوسُفْ مِثْلَ قَصَصَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ الْآخَرِينَ لأن الذين عادوه عادوه على الدنيا يعني على حسد محبة أبيه له والذين عادوا الأنبياء الآخرين عادوهم على الدين. The scholars mention that this is not the most amazing story in the Quran simply because the people that wage war against Yusuf or cause Yusuf the harm that they caused him they did so out of jealousy for something from this dunya and it had nothing to do with his religion they had enmity and hatred towards Yusuf solely based upon his the, the love that his father had for him and they were jealous and they were envious of him because of that and that's from the affairs of the dunya he said as for the stories of the prophets and messengers that are mentioned throughout the Quran their enemies had a problem with them as it relates to their deen and this is what makes their stories uh, far more superb and far more amazing than the story of Yusuf. فَفِيهَا مِنَ الْعِبْرَ أَنَّ الْمَظْلُومَ الْمَحْسُودِ إِذَا الصَّبْرَ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ كَانَتْ لَهُ وَالْعَاقِبَةِ That in this surah, there are so many lessons. And the greatest lesson that we can extract from this surah is that the mazloom, the person who is oppressed, والمحسود, and the person who uh, others are envious of him, all right, because of some blessing that he has, either sabr or taqullah kana lahu al akiba. That if he is patient and he fears Allah subhanahu wa taala, then the end result will be in his favor. The end result will always be in his favor. That if you are oppressed and you are, you know, envied for some blessing that you have, as the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as we'll talk tomorrow, the kulli the ni'matin mahsud. Everyone that has a blessing is going to be envied for the blessing that they have. And if you are patient with the harm that comes to you as a result of that, فَلَكَ الْعَقِبَ Then for you is a favorable in result. وَأَنَّ الظَّالَمَ الْحَاسِنْ قَدْ يَتُوبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَيَعْفُ عَنْهُ And that the person that oppressed you and the person that was envious of you, perhaps Allah can turn to them with forgiveness. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will find as he did with the brothers of Yusuf. That just because someone oppresses you, or someone takes a right away from you, or someone is envious of you or causes you some harm, that does not mean that their end result is hell, that they're going to hell for eternity. But perhaps something may happen throughout the course of their life, and they may change their way, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may forgive them. He said, وَأَنَّ الْمَظْلُونَ يَنْبَغِي لَهُ الْعَفْوُ عَنْ ظَالِمِهِ إِذَا قَدَرَ عَلَيْهِ وَبِهَذَا اِعْتَبَرَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ يَوْمَ فَتْحِ مَكَّةً لَمَّا قَامَ عَلَى بَابِ الْكَعْبَةِ وَقَدْ أَضَلَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ عَادَوْهُ وَحَارَبُوهُ مِنَ الطُّلَقَاءِ 
فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ماذا أنتم قائلون قالوا نقول أخ كريم وابن عم كريم فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إني قائل لكم كما قال يوسف لإخوته لا تثريب عليكم اليوم يغفر الله لكم وهو أرحم الراحمين he said, and also in this story, we should draw benefit from the fact that the person that is oppressed, it is imperative for him to pardon the people and excuse people for the harm that they caused him. The harm that they caused him. And we talked uh, some time before about, you know, letting down the burden of, you know, resentment with forgiveness. To forgive people and to pardon people and overlook even for the harm that they caused you in your life. And that may be difficult for us to do, but we have to learn how to forgive people. People harm people simply because maybe they were harmed. Hurt people hurt people. When people are hurt, their natural response is to hurt other people. And sometimes we are victims of that hurt. But we have to learn how to forgive people. We have to learn how to pardon people if we have the ability to do so. And before I get to the next benefit... The scholars mentioned that the surahs, the surahs from the Qur'an that were revealed prior to the Hijrah. And these are called the Surah al makkiyah These are the Meccan surahs. The Meccan surahs, they concentrated on three things. Number one, the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, the mention of the uh, fitna of the hereafter, the mention of Paradise and the mention of the hellfire. All of most of the ayahs regarding the paradise and the hellfire were mentioned in or revealed in the Meccan period. And the third thing that they concentrate on is the stories of the prophets and messengers. All of the stories of the prophets and messengers were revealed in the Meccan period before the Hijrah. And the scholars say that the reason for this was to give the Prophet ﷺ a glimpse of at some of the trials and tribulations of the prophets that came before him. Because a lot of times when we're going through trial and tribulation, we tend to believe that we are the only ones that are experiencing that pain. And when you realize that this is not exclusive to you, that there are other people who have gone through some of the same trials and tribulations that you are going through or, uh, or have gone through, then it makes it easier for you. It makes it easier for you to digest and to deal with the pain that comes to you. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam marra bi imra'atin waqifa ala qabr ibniha faqala laha nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam isbiri wa ahtasibi فقالت المرأة إليك عني فإنك لم تصب ما أصابني. That the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم passed by a woman who was standing over the grave of her child, and the Prophet said to the woman, noticing her grieving over the death of her child, he said to her, "Be patient and desire your reward from Allah." The woman, without turning around to see who it was, she said, "إليك عني, get away from me, because you haven't been tested with what I've been tested." You haven't been tested with what I've been tested. You don't know my pain. You don't know what I'm going through. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ lost a number of his children. He lost his son, Ibrahim. Ibrahim was only 16, 18 months old. 18 months old. The Prophet ﷺ was holding him in his hands while he was taking his last, fi sakaratin mot, sakaratin mot, taking his last breaths. <gasps> And you're holding your son in your hand. Can you imagine holding your child in your hand while he's taking his last breaths of life? And the Prophet ﷺ began to cry, Yabki, Bukatin Shadidin. And his companion, Abdurrahman ibn Auf, he turned to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Wa anta tabki, ya Rasulullah. Faqar al Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ya Abdurrahman, inna ha rahman, inna al ayna tadma' wa qalbun yahzan. He said, Abdurrahman turned to the Prophet وسلم, not really ever seeing him in this emotional state, right? The Prophet وسلم, always comes off or appears to be the strong man. Even some of the Sahaba used to hide behind him in battle. When he would fight jihad, the Sahaba would push him up front and they would be behind him. So to the companions, the Prophet وسلم, represent strength. He represented strength. Strength of character, strength of manhood. 
So this is the way that they were used to seeing him. And then seeing him in this emotional state, crying while holding his son in his hands. They couldn't believe it. And they seeing tears come from his eyes. And Abdurrahman turned to him and said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, even you cry? The Prophet Sallallahu said, Abdurrahman, this is Rahman, it's mercy. It's mercy. He said, my eyes may water with tears and my heart may feel pain, but my tongue will only say what is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you know, when the woman said, get away from me, you haven't been tested with what I've been tested with, she didn't realize that the person she was talking to had, in fact, experienced the same trial and the same tribulation that you experienced. But here again, when we're going through trial and tribulation, we tend to think that we are the only ones going through this. No one else understands our pain. Our children are the greatest you know, advocates of this. When our t especially teenagers. They believe that as parents, we were never teenagers before. We don't know what they're going through. Yes, your trial, your tribulation may be a little different, but it's all along the same lines of what you experience transitioning from childhood to adolescence to adulthood. We've all been there. We've all experienced it. Okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these stories of the prophets and messengers in the Meccan period prior, before the Hijrah, to give the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa a glimpse at some of the prophets and messengers that are shouldering the same task that you did, that you're shouldering, that have shouldered the same task that you are shouldering, and they went through the same trials and tribulations that you went through. An example of how he benefited from that is when he conquered Mecca. When he entered into Mecca and he conquered Mecca, right? He stood in front of the door of the Kaaba and he said to the Meccans, those same individuals that were responsible for harming him, pouring pig intestines on him, choking him, talking about him, calling him a liar, calling him, you know, a sahir, calling him a magician, calling him majnoon, calling him insane, and did all types of atrocious things to him. He stood up in front of them and he said to them, Ma antum ka'ilun. What do you have to say for yourselves now? What do you have to say for yourselves now? And they begin to plead with him. You know, plead with him. They said, Anta Akhun Kareem, you're you're a noble brother. Wa akha wa wa ibn Ammi Kareem and you are the our noble nephew. You know, we you, you we use those terms right, nephew, my nephew, when we want to flatter someone, right? They said you're you're a noble nephew and you're a noble brother, you know, trying to flatter him, you know, appease him. And the Prophet وسلم, said, Wa ana qa'inu lakum. And I'm going to say to you, what I have to say to you is the same thing that Yusuf said to his brothers. La Allahu lakum. I have I hold I don't hold you accountable today for all of the things that you did to me. I forgive you for all of the things that you did to me. I forgive you. Yaqfirullahu lakum. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives you. And he is the most merciful of those who have mercy. So he benefited from the story. You can see how he benefited from the story. Right? Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. When she was accused of adultery in the Qisat al ifq in Surah 24, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala captures that incident. When she was accused of zina, of adultery, the Prophet وسلم, and her mother and her father all gathered her in the house before the issue became clear to them. And they said to Aisha, قيل لها, إن كنت ألممت بذنب فاستغفر الله وتوب إليه. They said to, the, to Aisha, if in fact you did commit this sin, then just ask Allah for his forgiveness and turn to him in repentance. All right? This is Aisha. She cried for days. She said that her tear ducts ran, like she still felt the pain of tears, even though no tears came out because she couldn't produce any more tears. That's how long she was crying, right, for being accused of adultery. She couldn't even produce any tears anymore. That's how long she was crying, right? And then to have her husband, her father, and her mother still be unsure of whether or not she did it. And they said to her, if in fact you did commit this sin, then just seek Allah's forgiveness and turn to him in repentance. And Aisha, in a fit of frustration, have you ever been in a situation where you know you were right 
and other people are doubting whether or not you are truthful or you are or you're right and you just get so frustrated because you just can't understand why they won't believe you why they won't believe that you are right why would they even entertain such a notion about you seeing as though they're your family members all right it's a frustration and Aisha said to them in a fit of frustration قالت أقول وما أقول إلا كما قال يعقوب أبو يوسف فصبر جميل والله المستعان على ما تصفون. She said, I can only, I have nothing else to say to you except what Yusuf's father said to um, his his brothers. فصبر جميل. I can only exert a beautiful patience. والله المستعان and Allah's help is sought. For the things that you accuse me of. She benefited from the story of Yusuf. She benefited from the story. Because she extracted a benefit that she got from the story. And she applied it to her own personal life. And this is the benefit of reading the stories of the prophets and messengers in the Quran. And learning how to practically apply them to our lives today. And many times we'll read these stories. And we don't know. This is where we, you know. This is where the disconnect comes in because we'll read the Quran and then we'll have real life experiences where those verses are applicable and we won't know how to apply it. We won't know how to apply it. And that is the disconnect. The Quran is to be practiced, to be implemented. To be implemented. The last example is the Prophet ﷺ was distributing the war goods amongst his companions. And Sometimes he would give some more than he would give others. And that would be based upon circumstance and situation. Sometimes if someone was a new Muslim, Hadith al-Ahd islam he would give them more than he would give to someone who was Islam and Qadiman. You know, he accepted Islam from the very beginning. Because he's trying to make this person's heart firm on the religion. Iktisab al-Qalb. He wants to win his heart over. So he might give him a little more than he would give someone else. Someone from the outside, not really understanding the wisdom, would accuse the Prophet Sallallahu of being unfair. As one individual stood up and he said, مَا أُرِيدَ بِهَادِهِ الْقَسْمَ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ That he doesn't intend by this distribution the face of Allah. Nor is there any ikhlas, nor is there any sincerity in it. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud heard the man say this. And he said, وَاللَّهِ لَأُخْبِرَنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم بما قلت. He said, I swear by Allah, I'm going to go and tell the Prophet what you just said. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he came and he told the Prophet ﷺ that the man accused you of being disingenuous and accused you of not doing it for the sake of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ's face became red. He's, he's, his face became red and upset. He said, He said, Woe be to the people who make these comments. Who is going to be fair if Allah and His Messenger is not fair? If you accuse me of being unfair or unjust, then who is going to be fair if the Messenger of Allah is not fair? He said, Rahimallahu Musa kad udhiya bi akthara min dharika fa sabara. He said, May Allah have mercy on Musa. He was harmed with worse than this from his people and he was patient. He gained the benefit because he read the story of Musa. And he saw how Musa went through these things with his own people. And he benefited from that. He applied that benefit to his own life at that very moment. He said, may Allah have mercy on Musa. He was harmed with worse than this. And he was patient. So you can see that, you know, throughout these stories, he read these stories and he benefited from them. And he applied them to his own personal life. And he said to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, he said, I will never, after seeing the way that the Prophet Sallallahu changed, I will never bring him information that someone said about him again. And it shows us that Namima, tail carrying, coming to someone and says, guess what such and such said about you. And then he saw the demeanor of the Prophet Sallallahu change. And when you bring bad news to your brother and you see how it affects him, it should affect you as well. Don't bring me bad news. Don't bring me something that's going to change my day. Sometimes a person, you can be having a good day 
and someone comes to you and says, guess, guess what happened? And your whole day is ruined from that very piece of information that he gave you. Abdullah bin Mas'ud said, from this day forward, I will never bring another piece of information to him about something someone said about him. And this is for us to understand that when someone says something about your brother, it's not necessary for you to come to them and say, guess what I heard such and such say about you. Number one is Namima. And the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يدخل الجنة القتات. القتات يعني النمام. That the namam, the one who does tell carrying, will not enter into paradise. Right? And this is a very serious threat. A very serious threat. So we shouldn't be in a habit of bringing information to people that we know is going to create harm or change, you know, their demeanor or have an impact on them to such a degree that it changes, you know, the way that they feel or it changes their attitude or their mood for that particular day. So inshallah ta'ala, this is just some of the benefits that we can get from these first verses from Surah to Yusuf. And inshallah ta'ala, stay tuned because tomorrow inshallah ta'ala will move on. To the next verses in this surah and for the rest of the month of Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala, we will cover benefits from this particular surah so that we can leave out of the month of Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala, at least having a more clear understanding of this surah so that the next time that this surah is recited in our presence, we can ponder and reflect on some of the benefits that we got from it. And this is the way that you stay focused in your prayer. One of the ways to stay focused in your prayer is when you memorize a surah from the Qur'an and you go back and you read the tafsir of that surah so that you understand the asbab and nuzul, the reason why the surah was revealed, the ibar, the hikam, the lessons and the wisdoms that are found in those surahs so that when the surah is recited by the imam that you can contemplate and reflect on those verses as the imam or as the qari moves through each and every verse. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Wa sallallahu ala nabidu Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salama tasliman kathira wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.